to all of you. My dear friends, do you want the day star to shine down upon you? That he might shine through you 
in the darkness of this night that we are living in. Tonight, as we begin, let us pray. Lord, that is the prayer of this GYC conference, that the light of the day star Jesus would shine upon us, shine in us, and shine through us, that the darkness of this earth would be dissipated by the light of Your glory shining forth from Your people. And so tonight, as we enter this time of study, Lay everything aside in our life, Lord, and help us that we might focus on what you are calling each of us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll never forget the date, January the 8th. 1989. Let me pause for just a moment because last night I told a story from 1986. And as I prepared the message, I realized that the great majority of my audience was not alive in 1986 or 1989. Lest you think I'm old, I'm not old. I assure you, this does not yet fall into the category of ancient history. January the 8th, 1989, I was 14 years old. I'll help you so you don't have to do the math, so you can pay attention, I'm 43. <laughs> but on that day, my dad took me to the National Football Conference, the NFC Championship game the Chicago Bears versus the San Francisco 49ers. I lived in Chicago. It was our team. But it was a cold winter day. Wind chills, negative 20 Fahrenheit. But I was excited because the winner of this game was going to the Super Bowl. And having lived most of my life up until that point in Chicago, this was a big moment. After enduring a few hours of negative temperatures, my excitement dwindled to disappointment as the Bears lost the game. They were blown out, as a matter of fact. But I didn't realize it at that moment that the beginnings of my disappointment had only just begun. We took the Metra train back to the suburbs. We got in our car, and, and my dad took me out for Chinese food. I remember it like yesterday. It was bad Chinese food. <laughs> and there, as we sat, my dad shared with me something that would drastically change our family and my life forever. After 15 years of being married, my dad told me that he and my mom were going to get divorced. And I'll tell you, I didn't understand. I, I, I mean, I knew things were tough in our family, but I didn't think they were that bad. I grew up in a Catholic home. My parents were active in the church. I would not call our family devout, but we went to Mass every week. I was baptized, had my first communion, and was confirmed in the Catholic Church. My parents taught the youth and young adult class. Ironically enough, taught marriage enrichment classes. We went camping together as a family, our favorite destination being the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Amen. Copper Harbor to be exact. 
We had family together. We had family dinner together every single night. My mom, my dad, my three younger brothers, and myself all there at the table every single night. But now my dad told me that that all was going to end. And with that, it brought an uncontrolled downward spiral. First, in my spiritual life, I observed a church in which my parents were active. We knew people from the church. The priest would come to our home on occasion. And when my parents went through this, no one came. No one came. The members, the priests, no one came to visit. And while immature in my young teenage mind, I decided if this is what the church and God is all about, I've got no use for it. And I'll tell you, I never became an atheist. I knew there was something. I just didn't know what or who it was and where to find it. And I'll tell you, I became angry, unhealthy angry. I played football when I was in high school. And the field became the place where I dealt with my anger. My friends said that they didn't know who I was when I played ball. I literally left it all on the field. It was unhealthy, but it's how I dealt with it. Now, I don't want to give any illusions of grandeur. I was not headed for the NFL by any means. <laughs> but there were expectations that I could play in a smaller college program. However, in the midst of my high school, high school experience, on a soggy October day, I took an awkward hit, and my knee bent in ways that it's not designed to bend. And I laid there on the ground feeling like someone had shot me in the knee. One surgery turned into two surgeries. The doctor told me no more football, but that was okay because I wrestled so I could still settle it all on the mat. Three months of intensive rehab. I actually got my left leg stronger than my right leg. The first day that I was able to go live in practice, I blew my knee out again. 16 years old, macho wrestler, and I laid face down on the mat, weeping aloud, asking the question, why? Why is this happening to me? I spent the majority of my 10th and 11th grade year on crutches. And so with no outlet in sports, I turned to other things, all kinds of other things, and each of them left me more empty than I felt before I did them. Each of them actually making me more angry after their momentary dulling of the pain. I was so angry at so many things. And as my parents went through the divorce process, my dad moved out, and then he moved back in. And then he moved out again, and then he moved back in, and then he moved out, and he moved back in, and then he moved into his own room, and then he moved out forever. I was angry. As I got older, I began to get especially angry with my mom. And at the age of 18, believing I had learned all that I needed to learn in life, I blamed my mom entirely for the divorce of my parents. I blamed her for holding me back from the things that I wanted to do in life. And so three months after I graduated from high school, one day, my mom faithfully went to work as she had done since my father left to support me and my three younger brothers. I packed up all my stuff and I left, not telling her where I was going, not speaking to her.
I made no contact with my mom. You know, they say in life, everything happens for a reason. During the millennium, I'm gonna be asking the Lord about that one. But I'll tell you, my mom faithfully contacted me, wrote me cards, phone calls, never missed a holiday or a birthday, reaching out, telling me that she loved me, she wanted to talk to me, and in my insensitivity, I did not return any of her phone calls. My mom looked for excuses to send me cards on holidays that you normally don't send cards. She sent me cards on my birthday and on Christmas and Easter, the standard ones, but then she sent cards on Valentine's Day, and she sent cards on Halloween. And let me tell you something that's interesting. I'm 43 years old, and my mom still sends me candy on Halloween. <laughs> and if you want to write about the apostate nature of such things, you're missing the whole point of what my mom was trying to do. <laughs> Folks, that went on not contacting my mom for two years. Two years. In the midst of all of that, in being so angry and lost and confused, I was searching for who or what God was. I began attending a mega church in the Chicago area, but I didn't find what I was looking for. I went to the Pentecostal church. And I did not find what I was looking for. I had contact with the Mormons. I didn't find what I was looking for. I had a friend who was a Jehovah Witness who would talk to me about their religion, and I knew that that's what I was not looking for. Spiritual things to me were like taking a 500-piece puzzle, a 1,000-piece puzzle, and a 5,000-piece puzzle, putting it in a bag and mixing it all together. It just didn't make sense. I even went looking and attended a New Age conference over a weekend, and I knew that that's not what I was looking for. But God used that weekend during a time of personal reflection. I was 20 years old. I came to realize how selfish I was and how selfish I was being. And I called my mom. Think about it. What do you say? Hey, I forgot to call. Been two years. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what she would say. I didn't know how to say it. And as soon as my mom answered the phone and she heard my voice, she started crying. And all I could think of saying was, Mom, I'm sorry. And I'll tell you what, my mom accepted me back with not one condition laid upon me. No questions, no pressure. She just accepted me back. And I will tell you, in that moment, my mother taught me more about the love of Jesus than I had ever been taught in any church at that point in my life. I was lost and confused. I was still searching for the real meaning of life and Life circumstances took me from Chicago, Illinois to South Bend, Indiana, Mishawaka to be more exact. And when I arrived there, I needed a way to pay the bills, and so I took a job working the third shift at a Speedway gas station. And then one night, Someone came into the gas station, 
that would change my life forever. She worked the second shift as a nursing assistant at a nursing home right up the road. And she came in to get gas. Every night she came in to get gas, five dollars. She'd come and talk until the wee hours of the morning. She had grown up Seventh-day Adventist but was having her own spiritual struggles. But my interest in spiritual things awakened a renewed commitment in her life. And as our relationship became more serious, and as I asked more questions, she invited me to attend her home church in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And on that one night, we attended the Pioneer Memorial Church with a big satellite on the side of the church. And there that evening, as we attended, projected on the big screen was Mark Finley during the Net 95 series. My first message in the Adventist church in Net 95. Little did I know at that time the impact that this man would have on my life in later years. We attended more meetings that were held locally in a, the South Bend First Church, and I began learning so many things. Yet as I learned so many things, so many things that seemed to make logical sense, I was still very angry. See, now what I was dealing with as I learned these new things is how could I have lived 21 years of life and no one ever shared this with me before. And I want to tell you, dear friends, there are countless millions, if not billions of people around this earth who are in a situation just like I was. I was so angry, and I was trying to work through my guilt. It was in those moments that I sensed God arising in my life. At the same time, I was attending a Baptist church that my dad was going to which confused things even more. And at 21 years old, I made a decision to become a Baptist. This young lady didn't dump me to the side. She stayed close to me, and I brought home one day a, a Bible study on the secret rapture. And this young lady gave me a study on the second coming <laughs> that she probably could not replicate today, or at least not the intensity that existed. It was at that moment I knew that I needed, I needed to let go of my old ways. So I went and met the Adventist pastor. And I will tell you, in a decision that I still don't understand to this day, I came to the pastor's office to study with him, to understand the last few questions that I had about the Seventh-day Adventist church. And this Adventist pastor is waiting outside, and he says to me, hey, listen, I need to pick up my son from uh, Sam's Club, so why don't you jump in my car? Now, remind you, this is a man I don't know. And for some reason, I got in his car. <laughs> and there I sat in the front seat, and he says, so what are your questions? And I had the Bible in my hand. And I began asking him those questions that were most pertinent in my life. And there, sitting in the front seat of a Mercedes-Benz, God convicted my heart. I died to self, and that day made a decision to be, to become a part of God's last day movement of destiny. Amen. You see, the call of God was for me to arise and shine 
But before I could arise and shine, he needed to arise in my life, just as we talked about last night. And from my broken, bruised, ruined, and wasted life, Jesus arose. I drank from the fountain. God arose in my life. And as the light of the glory of his character came into my life, the call for God, from God was to arise. Isaiah 61, arise and shine. Yet tonight, as we look at this word arise, I need to tell you there is great irony in the word arise. Because in the ways of God, the only way that you can arise is that you would first die. Isaiah 60 and verse 2, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. Ephesians chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, open them to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. We're going to be moving through a number of texts rather quickly. Ephesians 5 and verse 8 expands upon this idea of the light breaking forth through the darkness. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 8. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. How did that happen? Well, Isaiah 60 already answered that. The Lord arose on us. That's how we come out of the darkness. But the text then continues. Walk as the children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light." for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, now take note, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ might give you light. No, no, he says, he will give you light. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. Don't miss it. This word awake and the word arise are synonymous words. You see, as you experience the Lord arising over you and his word, his character, take precedence and priority in your life. The call of God then is to awake or rise, but in order to arise, we must first die. The rising of God's character in our life helps us to realize that we must die to self and then arise in him. This death is to all of our old ways, but the most important thing is it is the death of self-reliance. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1, expounds further on this very principle. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who knew, now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as others. How many people is that, by the way? How many is it, does it say? All people, all of us once conducted ourselves in such a way. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, here it is, made us, what is the word there? alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and in the, excuse me, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved 
through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The call of Isaiah 60 is for us to arise, for you to arise. And that word there, arise, is a different word, a different Hebrew word used than the word that is used to describe God arising over us. It is the Hebrew word calm, and it refers to the physical action of standing up from a prostrated position. But that word is also, interestingly enough, used and translated as establish. When God established his covenant, it's the same exact word that Isaiah commands us to arise. You see, the call to arise is the call to die to our previous ways and then for God to raise us into a covenant relationship to stand with him, in him, in uprightness, resisting the temptations of the evil one and living a victorious life in him. And this is why Paul in Romans chapter 13, gave us this very promise. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to, what does it say there? Awake out of sleep for Now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. All of this that Paul is articulating, by the way, is simply a reminder of Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Yet with urgency, Paul calls us to take action. And the action he calls us to is to arise from death. How do we do that? Paul continues, Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Arise and shine is what Paul is saying. And then the passage continues, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or to fulfill its lusts. You see, the call of God to this last day generation, this generation that God is looking upon, asking, how will I finish the work through you? How will I finish the work in you? Is the call to arise, and we arise by casting off all of those things that hinder us from moving forward. This very word, cast off, is used six times in the New Testament. Listen to these. I'm going to go through them in rapid-fire progression. Ephesians 4.22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which was created according to God. Ephesians 4.25, therefore put away, it's the same word, cast off, put away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off, it's the same word, cast off, cast aside, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Hebrews 12, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, here it is, let us lay aside, it's the same word, cast off every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. 
James 1.21, therefore let us lay aside, cast aside, it's the same word, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. 1 Peter 2, therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. My dear brothers and sisters, the call of God is to arise, but the only way to arise is to die through full surrender to him, to die to our old ways, to let him raise you to the highest standards, and by his grace and his mercy to cast aside every hindrance, anything that impedes you, anything of the past, and live a life anew in him. I will tell you, this sermon was not supposed to start the way it did. I hesitate to tell my story. And the reason I hesitate to tell my story is because there are a number of you sitting here saying, that's not my story, that's a dramatic conversion, that's not my experience. I've actually had young people and even parents say to me, well, maybe I need to go and have a worldly experience and then I can have a dramatic story. My dear brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. That's like placing five bullets in a six shooter and playing Russian roulette. And if you're not getting the analogy, here's what I'm telling you. That's foolishness. Because here is the reality and don't miss this young people. Here is the reality. Romans 3.23 is clear. For, what's the word? That's not convincing. What's the word? All. all. How many? All. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No exceptions. It doesn't say, except for those who were homeschooled on a country farm. <laughs> it doesn't say, except for those who have gone to Adventist schools all their life. It doesn't say, except for those who went to the campus program, or those who do summer canvassy, or except those who have served as student missionaries. No, the Bible is clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And let me tell you this. Isaiah 64, 6 makes it all real clear, real fast. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. My dear brothers and sisters, no matter how protected an environment you grew up in, no matter how godly your parents were, and by the way, those are all wonderful things, because I will tell you, there are days where I wish I had not seen the things I've seen. But let me tell you, the miracle that happened in my life is no more a miracle than the miracle happening in your life because you, you have been plucked as a brand from the fire just as I was plucked. You don't need a dramatic story because your story is already dramatic. Here's the reality. You are a sinner in need of a Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. You cannot make a decision for him by mere culture or heredity. You must make a decision for yourself. You must die. Amen. And then by the power of the indwelling Christ who is risen upon you, you must arise. Amen. Casting aside your former conduct, the old man, the old woman, putting away lying, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, all filthiness, wickedness, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. And if you wrestle with none of those categories fitting you, then Paul made it real clear in Hebrews chapter 12, lay aside every weight, anything, that ensnares you. When I pastored in the Chesapeake Conference during camp meeting, I was in charge of the primaries. 
I believe that that is actually part of the path towards ordination in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. If you can survive the primaries, you can survive anything. Amen. One of our activities during our primary time during camp meeting is we went to the pool. I had a number of young people helping me, but life gets really exciting when you have 60, seven to nine year olds jumping in pool, in a pool. Well, my teenagers, my teenagers, they, you know, these bricks that they coat with rubber that you can drop to the bottom of the pool and dive down and pick it up and come to the top. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe? Okay, good. It's not even a Canadian thing. That's a, you know, that's a Maryland thing, so. <laughs> Anyways. Here's what happened. The seven to nine-year-olds saw the teenagers diving to get the brick, and guess what? They wanted to do it. So we started in the six-foot end of the pool and said, okay, you can do it, and that wasn't good enough. They wanted to go in the, you know, 15-foot end. And that was a little nerve-wracking, and so I had all of my teenagers surrounding and these seven to nine-year-olds would dive down and they'd get the brick and sure, some of them would come up to the top. But let me tell you what the great majority would happen. They'd get that brick and with all their might, they would kick, 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 and they'd get about a foot and a half from the top of the water. And then they just levitated there. They couldn't get enough power to come up out of the water. I'd let that go on for a few moments. <laughs> see the goal is you don't want, you don't want to lose anybody. <laughs> and every last one of them, every last one of them, I would grab them and pull them up out of the water and I'd ask them one simple question. Why didn't you let go of the brick? And they'd always say to me, Pastor, because I just wanted to get to the top. And I'm afraid, my dear young people, many of us are striving for a mountaintop experience while we're hanging on to the brick. And we can't get to the top, and no matter what we do, no matter how hard we kick, we keep having the same issue over and over again. And all Jesus is saying to you is you, I want you to arise. But in order to arise, you must die. And in order to die, you must let go of the brick. You may not think your story is as dramatic as mine, but there is only one path, as Pilgrim Pilgrim's Progress calls it. There's only one path to the celestial city. And that goes right through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Abraham was called to be the father of nations, but he had a problem. There was no heir. You know the story of Abraham well. By faith, he came out of Ur of the Chaldees. By faith, he took the land that looked less fertile. but he had some bumps and bruises, and for him the brick was, I don't have a son. He took matters into his own hands, and the consequence of that sin is still seen ever-present on the news today. 
But then the Bible says at the appointed time, Isaac was born. The son of the promise. But then, after the son of the promise had been born, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son. Abraham had been confident in heredity and not the power of God. And God needed to test Abraham and say, are you willing to lay everything on the altar, including your son? Before we are too critical of God asking for such thing, he did not ask Abraham to give any more than God himself was willing to give. And in that passage read in Genesis 22, we see the faith of Abraham exemplified as he leaves behind those servants. And in verse 4 of Genesis 22, Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey and, excuse me, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. It's a two letter word, but it is ever important. And we we'll come back to you. Hebrews 11 makes it clear. Abraham went there somehow, some way. God arose upon Abraham. Abraham died to self. He had a reconversion experience where he understood that the promise of God was not about heredity, but the promise of God was about the power of God working in him and working through him, and Abraham was willing to take his boy to the altar, but in faith knew that God would provide a ram or that God would raise him from the dead. And tonight I want to ask you this simple question, what's your Isaac? What's your brick? What is it that God's calling you to lay on the altar? Just as I did last night, I'm going to make three appeals. This is going to be a more difficult appeal because I'm not going to call everybody to stand. But tonight, The first appeal is this. You've not been baptized and you've sensed your need for the Lord to arise in your life. Tonight you want to answer the call to arise. Tonight you sense that you need to die to self and you want to arise in him. Maybe you know you've strayed far from him and you need to rededicate yourself through rebaptism. I'm going to invite you to come forward now. Tonight you're going to commit yourself to being baptized. You come right in front of that screen there. We have people waiting for you. Number two, you've sensed that God is calling you to cast aside all things that are between you and him. You know that there's that one thing or maybe there are multiple things that are holding you back tonight and you want to let go in a special commitment. You want to let go of that Isaac. You want to let go of that brick. You come forward right here tonight. And then the third... You need Jesus to arise in your life through his word. And somehow, some way, your devotional life has grown stale. And you're in a valley, and tonight, by faith, you're coming forward. 
asking that God would renew that experience in you. You come forward. While Sonia plays and Marlita sings, what's your Isaac tonight? Come forward. Not because everybody else is coming. Come forward. Those of you who want to be baptized right over here, come right in front of the screen as Marlita sings. Each idol 
tonight you've come forward. And as you've come forward, you have made a decision to lay your Isaac down. You've made a decision to let go of the brick. You've made a decision to be baptized. It's easy in conferences like this to go home and pick Isaac back up. It's easy to go home and pick the brick up. Young people, I want to urge you, don't leave, don't leave this room tonight. Whether you write it in your journal, whether you put it in a note in your phone, write down your decision. Date the decision. And then come up with a plan. What are you going to do tonight? What will you do tomorrow morning? But more importantly, what are you going to do on Monday morning when you've left this place? God's calling. He must arise. Tonight, he's calling for you to arise. Cast it all away and lay your burdens down. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, each of us have our Isaacs. Each of us have those bricks. You've called upon us to die to self and cast this all aside. Maybe there's someone here tonight that's been struggling year after year holding on to that brick.